welcome back to my channel and in today's video we discuss a very important concept from the shoulder complex biomechanics and this is a topic that many of you were eagerly waiting for that is the integrated function in the shoulder complex. I know that some of you while reading the textbook when you see this few pages and this topic you just keep on think, thinking that it is a bit tough and difficult to understand but here we will simplify it in the most easiest manner. The integrated function in the shoulder complex can be broadly classified into two types. The integrated function at the joints or by the joints and integrated function by the muscles. Integrated by jo function by the joint means integrated function or the range of motion that is contributed by the four different joints of the shoulder complex which include sternoclavicular, acromioclavicular, scapulothoracic and glenohumeral joint. How these four joints work together to produce the functional task or functional range of motion in the shoulder complex that is what we focus at integrated function at the joints or by the, by the muscles you know that how different Different muscles of the shoulder different muscles of the shoulder works together to produce the available range of motion at what degree or what range of motion different muscles get activated and deactivated to enable the complete range of motion at the shoulder that is what we discuss by integrated function by the muscles which we will focus on the upcoming sessions and this session we focus on integrated function by the joints and further integrated function by the joints can be divided into integrated function by scapulothoracic and glenohumeral joint and integrated function by acromioclavicular and sternoclavicular joint. How these two joints works together to produce the J range of motion and how these two joints works together to produce the ultimate complete range of motion available at the shoulder. So let us see in this video about the contribution of sternoclavicular and glenohumeral joint and discuss a very important concept in that that is the scapulohumeral rhythm which is very important either in your practical life or in your educational academic. So let us discuss this in the most simplified manner in Tony's tutorial. Here we discuss integrated function by the joints and that too in particular the scapulothoracic joint, the scapulothoracic joint and glenohumeral joint. How these two joints function together to produce the available range of motion at the shoulder complex. But let me ask you, why do we need an integrated function in the shoulder complex and why is it a topic worth discussion? Can you imagine a situation in which uh, your sternoclavicular joint will do the function but other three joints are going to sit idle and not doing the function or the vice versa the glenohumeral is active all other joints do not participate in that motion or each of these four joints contribute individually to the function it's not a ideal situation or it's not a situation that is happening in our daily life that is because in every complex all the joints completely works together to produce a complete or whole range of motion and not just in a shoulder complex or in another complex like an angle complex but even in the upper limb for example or in the lower limb or even the whole body for example when you're reaching out for a task the function is actually contributed by your which all joint complex is involved your elbow complex is involved wrist complex and even the simple small joints in the fingers are also involved in this function so in body all the segments works together as a chain or works together to perform the functions or daily task or functional activities that is why integrated function is very important in shoulder complex because we have about four joints performing different functions and ultimately they have to perform a common function so let us see how that is done basically understand that integrated functions are done or is done for doing the task in the simplest and with the greatest range of motion that means doing the task doing the range of motion activities in simple man without any effort without any pain and also for achieving maximum range of motion or the greatest range of motion that is possible with that is not possible with individual joints 
right? So let us discuss about the scapulothoracic and glenohumeral contribution. To understand this, I want you to imagine a hypothetical situation. That means an imaginary situation in which your glenohumeral joint is not going to function or it is locked in a position. It's not moving. So if you are trying to move for shoulder elevation, all these activities are predominantly done by your glenohumeral joint. So if this glenohumeral joint is not working or not contributing to the shoulder complex function how far elevation can you achieve you can achieve some degree of elevation with the help of your scapulothoracic joint alone how far the scapulothoracic joint can contribute about 50 to 60 percentage 60 degrees of elevation how far the scapulothoracic joint can contribute to 50 to 60 percentage degrees of elevation at the time the elevation stops and you cannot do further because your glenohumeral joint is not involved that means or that indicates that the scapulothoracic joint has some function in the elevation of the arm understand elevation means flexion and abduction or flexion or abduction okay and in this scenario just let us think the opposite our glenohumeral joint is not only functioning and scapulothoracic joint is immobile how far or what range of motion can you achieve in shoulder flexion? We have studied the range of motion in shoulder complex function in the glenohumeral joint function itself. How far it was? In flexion, you get a range of motion about 100 to 120 degree. Whereas in abduction, you get a range of motion about 100 to 90 to 120 degree. But at the same time, you know that the total available range of motion at the shoulder for flexion or abduction is about 180 degree or more approximately 150 to 180 degree. Why do we always uh, take a reference standard between two values in biomechanics but if uh, in other subjects you just learn flexion is 120 degree, 90 degree, etc. That is because we take into consideration the individual variations that can exist. For example, the glenohumeral joint, uh, the glenoid fossa orientation or the scapular orientation, anything any of those orientation can vary between individuals in other subjects and other studies we often neglect that uh, variations and take a standard value but in biomechanics we take into consideration the variations that can exist and that is why we always have a standard range of reference for values in biomechanics okay right now uh, if somebody asks you what is the uh, range of motion available in shoulder complex sorry the glenohumeral joint for it in a competitive exam just mention 120 degree not go for 100 to 9, 120 degree if this option is given you can definitely go for that otherwise don't get worried whether to write 100 or 120 go for the highest value which you follow in other texts or other subjects right now our point of discussion is not that we were discussing about the total available range of motion at the shoulder complex which is 150 to 180 degree now look at here um, here you can see that the range of motion is about 100 to 120 90 to 120 50 to 60 but the total available range of motion is more so how can you get this total range of motion just add both of this just add both of this if this 100 and this 60 or 120 and 60 adds on you get the total range of motion or of 180 if you add this 150 and 100 you get a total range of motion of 150 to 180 so you see from this that there is some sort of relationship between action or range of motion that is available in scapulothoracic and glenohumeral joint either of this joint cannot neither of this joint cannot individually result in total range of motion but their combined function can give you the complete range of motion and that is what we are going to discuss and that is what our point of discussion is all about the total available range of motion at the shoulder complex is not a function of individualized movement of glenohumeral joint or not a function of individualized movement of scapulothoracic joint but 
it is a function of synchronized movement between glenohumeral and scapulothoracic joint and that we call by a beautiful term known as the scapulohumeral rhythm the scapulohumeral rhythm the rhythm between scapula and the humerus the scapulothoracic joint and the glenohumeral joint what is that what is scapulohumeral rhythm that is a synchronized movement or there is a combination of movement of both the scapulothoracic joint and glenohumeral joint in achieving the total range of motion at the shoulder complex and this relationship this relationship is known as the scapulohumeral rhythm and if you look at this value you can denote or you can derive or you can um, we can derive a value or a standardized relationship between this value this is almost double of the value of the scapulothoracic joint so we see that there is a 2 is to 1 ratio between the scapulothoracic joint and the glenohumeral joint during the arm movement that is during arm movement of elevation whether it is flexion or abduction we have a ratio between the movements that are possible in the scapulothoracic and the movement that are possible in the glenohumeral this ratio is about 2 is to 1 and that we call by the term scapulohumeral rhythm so we can modify the scapulohumeral rhythm as a 2 is to 1 ratio that exists between the motions of sternal scapulothoracic and glenohumeral joint movement in the total range of motion available at the shoulder complex am i clear this is a relatively simple concept if you just guess the essence it is just nothing but you have to understand basically the function at the shoulder complex cannot be done individually by the glenohumeral joint or the scapulothoracic joint there is a contribution by glenohumeral and scapulothoracic joint and we name uh, we look forward that contribution we look for that contribution and finally at the arrive at scapulohumeral rhythm which states that there is a ratio of 2 is to 1 existing between the motions of scapulothoracic and glenohumeral rhythm or motions. So you have the ratio as a 2 is to 1. So if there is a 180 degree is the total range of motion, what will be the contribution by scapulothoracic and glenohumeral joints? The scapulothoracic joint will contribute 1 ratio that is 60 whereas this will contribute about 120 that gives the ratio 2 is to 1. That is is there is a ratio of 2 is to 1 that is existing between scapulothoracic and glenohumeral joint. Let us take one another range of motion for example 120 degree if the total range of motion available. How far will be the contribution of a scapulothoracic and glenohumeral? Well, glenohumeral will be 2 2 is to 1 would be the ratio. So the glenohumeral contribution will be around 90 degree whereas scapulothoracic joint will be one percentage of that that is about 30 degree. So this will be the relative contribution to the available range of motion at the shoulder complex when the glenohumeral and the scapulothoracic joints are functioning together. So, so far we were discussing about the scapulothoracic joint motion. Which motion? That is the upward rotation of the scapula is the predominant motion that occur at the time of shoulder elevation, flexion or abduction. That is, this scapulohumeral rhythm, we can redefine it as the 2 is to 1 ratio that exists between scapulothoracic joint motion, most predominantly the upward rotation and the glenohumeral flexion or glenohumeral elevation in the shoulder complex movement. So, we were discussing about the scapulohumeral rhythm. At the same time, do you know what are the range of motion that are, which are the possible motions that are seen in the scapulothoracic joint? We know that it is the upward and downward rotation. We know that it is the internal rotation and external rotation. 
we know there is a protraction and retraction we know there is a inter uh, what do you call anterior and posterior tilting and we know there is elevation and depression so these are the total range of motions or different motions that are possible in the scapulothoracic joint so we discuss about only one motion that is the upward rotation which occur about 50 to 60 degree or which is the predominant motion happening in the scapula what about the other motions are this motions or aren't these motions contributing towards the glenohumeral function yes of course these motions are also having a different role in the glenohumeral function let us examine how that is going to happen for example in the arm movement for example in the elevation initially we have a slight internal rotation of the scapula so during the initial stages of scapular movement or glenohumeral movement the scapula slightly rotates interiorly but when that motion progresses you can see that the scapula goes for external rotation which is a now this is the internal rotation and this is the external rotation so if at all the internal rotation predominates what can happen if the scapula is going for rotation like this what can happen to the medial border of the scapula the medial border of the scapula may become prominent like this when the medial border of the scapula pro become prominent we have a condition on us winging of the scapula which is due to the weakness of serratus anterior and latissimus dorsi muscle more predominantly the serratus anterior muscle so there is a what about what is the range of internal and external rotation there is a slight degree of internal rotation which happens at the initial ranges of scapular motion and after that when elevation happens the scapula is going for external rotation like this the scapula is going for external rotation so that is all about internal and external rotation what about protraction and retraction during the flexion activities definitely you can see that there is slight protraction of the scapula when there is elevation activity and abduction activity there is a slight amount of protraction but the relative amount is very minimal then what about anterior and posterior tilting the anterior and posterior tilting is another the predominant motion that happens in the scapulohumeral rhythm or in the relation between scapulothoracic joint and the glenohumeral joint how is it going to happen for example this is the scapula in the initial stages of a glenohumeral flexion or abduction what can happen is that scapula will go for a posterior tilting movement posterior tilting movement this is the posterior tilting movement end of the scapula moves anteriorly what is the use of this movement you know that during the flexion activities or abduction activity our scapula has to move with the thorax so this initial degree of posterior tilting will enable the scapula to move with the curvature of the thorax move with the curvature of thorax throughout the range of motion because the flexion is or elevation is a range of motion that is happening upwards and thus the scapula will move for a posterior tilting so during scapular elevation for example when you reach about 150 degree of elevation you have about 30 degree of scapula posterior tilting posterior tilting there is the posterior tilting because the scapula it enables the scapula to form or to go through the curvature of the thorax for example you see that if this activity is elevation if activity is elevation this is the thorax the body is the thorax and scapula is resting like this for example if the scapula is elevating the scapula is going for anterior tilting what can happen definitely it can go away from the thorax and that is not something that is good so scapula goes for or the muscles around it produce the posterior tilting of the scapula there is also another use of the posterior tilting that is when scapula is posterior tilting the acromion is a Pro, uh, projected backward so that there is less impingement or less chance of reduction in the subacromial space we can see that subacromial process of the scapula also moves backward which helps in reducing the impingement as well as in decreasing uh, preventing the decrease in the range of motion sorry in the space available in the subacromial space so we saw that uh, the scapular thoracic movements of internal rotation and external rotation can happen protraction and retraction happen and anterior and posterior tilting also happen Elevation and depression is in fact the transuratory motion. So not a great degree of elevation and depression does occur with the scapulothoracic movement. But a slight degree of elevation also can occur during the stages. Now, 
I have been telling and we have been studying about the scapular humeral rhythm. There is a scapula working, there is humerus working. There is scapular upward rotation going on. This is the upward rotation of scapula. Okay, the upward rotation of the scapula is going on. But let me ask you, or you might have a doubt that when is the scapula going for upward rotation? Or is scapula going to work first? Or is humerus going to work first? Or scapula going to work and after that humerus is going to work? Or the vice versa? We need to answer that question. To understand that, we need to understand the stages or phases of the scapular humeral rhythm. In general, we can divide it into three or two phases. Sometimes three phases or two phases. Let's take the three. That is an initial phase, which is same whether it is a two phase or three phase model. That is initial stage of a setting phase or an early phase initial stage or a setting or an early phase what do you mean by setting phase and early phase you know that the scapula is not resting like this it is having a resting position which is slightly internally tilt internally rotated slightly upward rotated and slightly anteriorly tilted this is the resting position of scapula and it is not a relatively a very functional or a stable position so during the elevation activity during the initial degrees of elevation activity 60 or 30 degrees of elevation activity mostly 30 degree of elevation no need to uh, forget uh, remember about the range of motion but remember initial degrees of uh, uh, shoulder complex activity the scapula tries to stabilize itself with the thorax that means it will uh, adjust itself uh, so that it is getting stabilized with the thorax the stabilization with the thorax is in a, a very essential because scapula is not in a very stable position or scapular position of resting position is not like normal with the other joints, other bones like a humerus or the uh, sternocle or the clavicle, etc. So there is a three phase or a different phases for the scapular humeral rhythm. The first one comes to be your phase one, which is an initial phase or early phase or you can call it as a setting phase of the scapular humeral rhythm during this phase the scapula tries to stabilize itself it will look after its uh, the role of a stabilization of the scapula itself that means uh, scapula will not contribute to the glenohumeral joint motion or the total range of motion so during the initial phase it is purely the glenohumeral joint that is uh, uh, functioning or contributing the range of motion then comes the next phase that is a phase two or uh, which we can call the late phase the glenohumeral joint contributes along with the scapulohumeral rhythm. The scapula has already stabilized itself, so scapula can contribute to the motion. Then we can have a phase three, which is same as uh, phase two. There is the contribution of a glenohumeral and scapulohumeral scapulothoracic joint. At this, all the phases, there is also contribution by the other degrees of motions of the scapula also also and the tilting posterior tilting summary is that there is three phases for the scapular thoracic joint in motion or scapular humeral rhythm that is a phase one which is the initial phase phase two and three which is more or less similar and the only difference here or the major difference major thing that you should note here is that the scapular thoracic joint is not going to contribute in the initial degrees of the range of motion that initial degrees are contributed by your glenohumeral joint alone. The scapula here tries to stabilize itself with the thorax and that is what happening during that initial phase. And now I need you to understand that uh, even though we saw that uh, there is a ratio like uh, 2 is to 1 existing. The recent study shows that, shows that the scapular humeral rhythm is a misnomer. That is, there is no rhythm that is happening actually, but only there is a synchronization of activities. But if you are just interested in this for the academic point of view, just avoid this point. That is because there is some variations or some value about 1.25 to 2.5 which are seen for the rhythm. So instead of this 2 is to 1 value, we have a value which the rate study shows like around 1.25 to 2 is to 1, 2.5 is to 1.2 etc. That is uh, as the uh, new rhythm. And that too exists or vary between individual to individual. 
religion so we cannot have a rhythm but still we can have but still they say that uh, there is synchronization of activity that is a different thing but the extent of that synchronization is not to be generalized but it is always better we have this value as the reference point for our clinical practice too and always when you have a suspected uh, scapular uh, humeral rhythm issues or scapular range of motion issues or glenohumeral range of motion issues always evaluate scapular thoracic joint in both sides and then arrive at a conclusion and especially evaluate scapular humeral rhythm in flexion as well as in depression. It is depression is the time when the scapula may fall off suddenly when there is a muscular imbalance or associated problem. So evaluate this in both the range of motion and definitely evaluate with the both the shoulder complexes, both the shoulders and arrive at a conclusion rather than trusting on a value of standardized value. But still until the researchers prove with this is wrong, we can definitely go for the two is to one value itself. So that is all about the scapulohumeral rhythm which is saying that there is some ratio between scapulothoracic and glenohumeral joint to completely enable the complete function at achievable at the shoulder complex and in upcoming video we will discuss the contribution of acromioclavicular and sternoclavicular and finally we will uh, connect the both this and derive or conclude how the shoulder complex is working completely with respect to the joints and later on we will add up with the muscles also so until then stay tuned and if you like the video don't forget to click the like button and kindly subscribe to our channel